I'd like to begin by acknowledging the traditional owners of the land on which we meet today and pay my respect to their elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are participating in our seminar today. Our talk this morning is on the Copernicus Australasia Regional Data Hub, Australasia's gateway to Sentinel satellite data from Europe's Copernicus program. Although I am a little intrigued by the title's reference to Eurovision, so I look forward to hearing more. Today's distinguished Geoscience Australia lecturer, a lecturer is Ala Metalenko. Ala leads the operations of the Copernicus Australasia Regional Data Hub. This includes managing the relationships that underpin the multifaceted partnership of consortium partners, suppliers and supporters who all work together to enable access and delivery of sentinel imagery to our region. Ala joined the public service as a remote sensing analyst in 1998, then moved quickly to manage uh, stakeholder relations in a variety of different positions, including the Interdepartmental Committee on Law of the Sea, Account Manager for the Australian Centre for Remote Sensing, ACRES, Government Clients, Executive Officer of the Intergovernmental Committee on Surveying and Mapping. She then led a, and managed a uh, variety of sections in GA, namely ACRES operations, spatial decision and support systems, and business intelligence. Ala study, studied at RMIT University, where she acquired a bachelor's degree in land information with first class honours, followed by a master's of applied science by research in remote sensing and GIS. Her master's research used remote sensing, coupled with spatial and statistical modelling to develop a hierarchical classification system to map the habitat of one of Australia's threatened bird species, the Plains Wanderer, in Northern Plains of Victoria. So please join me in welcoming Ala. Ala, we look forward to your seminar today and over to you. Thanks, Alison. I just felt the uh, sort of 20 years of my life just passed then. Um, thank you. Thank you, everyone, um, and welcome. Today's presentation, um, what I'd like to share with you, I'll just give you a, a quick overview to begin with. Um, what I'll share with you today is um, tell you about a little bit about who we are and what we do, why we have come together and why the work that we do is important and what are we good at and the challenges we're currently faced with and how we plan to tackle these. As I was putting this list together, I was thinking, oh, um, what's Eurovision got to do with it? And um, a song popped into my head. Um, it was, uh, what's love got to do with it? Um, for those who are too young in the room, this is Tina Turner. Uh, she released the song What's Love Got To Do With It in 1984, great era for big hair. And um, I reflected on that question and I thought, well, what does love have to do with it? And I thought, gosh, love's got to do with everything. Um, if it wasn't for love, I wouldn't be here talking to you through this virtual means. You wouldn't be here looking through your device at me, let alone we wouldn't be congregating here if we didn't have the love and passion for the work that we do. So love has everything to do with it, but I'm not here to talk to you about love. I'm actually going to be here talking to you about the Copernicus Australasia Regional Data Hub and Australia's role in the Eurovision of satellites. What's Eurovision got to do with it? So come with me, let's find out. The Copernicus Australasia Regional Data Hub is a repository providing users free and open, reliable access to Sentinel data. We acquire data over this footprint defined by the purple polygon on my right. Basically, it's Australia's gateway or Australasia's gateway to Sentinel satellite data from Europe's Copernicus program into our region. What is the Copernicus program? Well, it's Europe's $6.7 billion euro program, which is a 20 year plus program. 
It's funded by the EU state members and managed by the European Commission, operated in conjunction with the European Space Agency and the European Organisation for the Exploitation of Metrological Satellites, UMETSAT, who build, launch and operate the satellites in collaboration with industry. The Copernicus program will have six families of satellites that are called the Sentinels and a further 30 or so contributing missions. The satellite data acquired by Copernicus is open and freely available to all on this planet. Europe's Eye on Earth is a revolutionary Earth observation monitoring program that offers a world of insights about our planet. Copernicus transforms information from multi-sources, including the satellite, Sentinel satellites it's launched, and also in situ measurements and other spatial information to deliver operational services for keeping watch over the planet, our planet Earth, its land, ocean, atmosphere, as well as monitoring climate change, supporting emergency management and safeguarding civil security. At the moment, Copernicus already has five Sentinel missions operating. You can see the satellites here in the presentation. We've got Sentinel 1, 2, 3, which both have tandem satellites orbiting at this present time, and Sentinel 5P. So The Copernicus Australasia Regional Data Hub is classified under the international hub arrangements of the Copernicus Access configuration. It's the green column, as you see, and the green um, arrows um, pointing to. Um, the primary, the Copernicus region um, hub was established to build a first port of call for bulk government and scientific research users. It was established under a series of partnership arrangements, including consortium partners who have financed um, and also operate and manage the, the hub. The partners, as you can see here, around the, the green circle are CSIRO, Queensland Government Representative, New South Wales Landgate, and of course, Geoscience Australia, who's the project manager. So the delivery partners provide syncing uh, and distribution services across the globe. These are those you can see on the bottom banner on your uh, bottom right, comprising NCI, RRNet and um, Giant. The supporting partners um, help facilitate the access to the free and open data, and these comprise, as I've already mentioned, European Union and uh, ESA and UMETSAT. Our people um, comprised of um, members of Geoscience Australia, New South Wales Department of Planning, Industry and Environment, Queensland Department of uh, Environment and Science and Western Australia Land Information represented by Landgate. Uh, we also have the European Commission, ESA, CSIRO and NCI who um, are included um, but didn't provide their, their lovely faces today. The hub is unique as it provides a valuable collection of Sentinel 1, 2 and 3 data as well as 5P data. It provides the data from the level of raw to analysis ready. So it's a great range of products um, and it uh, provides all the data from the beginning of each mission to the current date and it's refreshed within 12 hours of every satellite overpass. It provides a sovereign copy and um, and a very good data provenance and ensures ongoing security and supply of the data in our region. It is a cost-effective way to sync, share and manage petabytes of Sentinel data from Europe within our region and beyond. This is a quick uh, summary of the products that we are currently harbouring in the hub. As mentioned earlier, it comprises of all Sentinel 1, 2 and 3, both A and B satellites. And Sentinel 1 is synthetic aperture radar, which is a, a passive or actually an active sensor which acquires SAR data. The Sentinel 2 is a multispectral um, imager which provides a similar um, well, similar imagery to Landsat, if you like, and Sentinel 3 A and B. Each of those birds have three instruments on board and that covers high optical imagery, radar and altimetry data. Sentinel-5P is a precursor mission that will, that will provide dedicated atmospheric composite monitoring information. 
The hub at the moment is about uh, 3.5 petabytes in size. Um, it's located at the NCI in here in Canberra and it's growing to about one petabyte a year. Um, it's uh, distributed about 10 petabytes of data since its inception. Uh, the graph here on the top right is an accumulative graph of what you see that's been pulled out of the hub at the NCI. Who are our users? Well, we, we monitor that on a monthly basis and we've got about 700 users that come from up to 40 different countries. The map here is, a, you could call a heat map if you like, and it shows who those countries um, are in terms of the user pool. The graph on the bottom actually graphs the amount of terabytes that have been pulled from the hub. So we've got Australia, Philippines, New Caledonia, and then Indonesia and France. So, and we monitor that on a monthly basis. And I'll talk a bit more about these reporting tools because they're an important element to what and how we manage the hub. So how do people access the data from a hub? We've got a dedicated Sentinel Analysis Regional Access Portal. There are actually four ways that users can access the data, but the Sentinel uh, Access or SARA portal has the, the map GUI, uh, but it also have, has the Python API, which uh, enables advanced users to pull bulk uh, amount of data through the hub. It also provides data through the NCI thread server, and those who are registered at um, the NCI can access it directly through the disk. What we tend to do is encourage users to go through SARA because we register um, who's downloading it, how much is being download, downloaded, and these statistics are reported back to the European Commission via ESA. And this is one of the obligations that we have under the arrangement with the European Commission. Um, so to recap, okay, so the data hub is a secure way to access Sentinel data from the beginning of mission to the current date with a 12 hour refresh. It provides us with a sovereign copy and it ensures the data supply into our region. It provides data from the Copernicus program, Sentinel-1, 2 and 3 missions and Sentinel-5P. The hub is located at the NCI. It's about 3.5 in, um, petabytes in size, growing on a petabyte per annum basis and we have distributed plus 10 petabytes to, to up to 70 users in 40 different countries on a monthly basis. But the 10 petabytes is an accumulative value since the operations of the hub. That's not a, a 10 petabyte download per month, just for clarification. So the hub was established by a series of uh, agreements and consortium partners came together in two, 2017. Followed, this was um, quickly followed by this, of course, initial signing of the agreement with the European Commission and then technical arrangements with the European Space Agency and UMETSAT, which occurred in 2016. Ah, so what's Eurovision for those who um, don't know? I, I find that uh, let me let me let, let me um, share with you what Eurovision is about. So Eurovision is about uh, it's actually a, a song contest that started in uh, 1956. It stems from the desire to promote and cooperate uh, through board cross-border television broadcasts between countries year, the years following World War II. So it was. It actually founded the European Broadcasting Union. Um, so the image on your um, top right corner is basically the region that it broadcasted to. So the areas um, shaded in red. So that was the Free Broadcasting Union um, expanse of television or televising the Eurovision contest. Since its inception, Eurovision has hosted 64 contests uh, contest to date. Um, we didn't have one this year, 2020, because of the coronavirus pandemic. At its 30th contest, contest in 1985, um, Eurovision was actually broadcasted via satellite. There's your first link. And then the second one was broadcasted in, on the 45th uh, um, contest was actually broadcasted uh, via the internet. The map on the bottom here is actually shows you um, the countries that participated in Eurovision based on the years that they entered. You can see that pr the primary contestants are continental Europe with UK and Sweden as primary and then expanded out um, further, if you say southwest eh, to include Spain and Portugal and then further into Africa and then further east to Middle East and then you've got the Baltic states and the Eastern European countries coming in. But you also notice Australia 
it uh, joined in 2015. There you go. So why did we come together? The Copernicus Australia Regional Data Hub came together um, simply because Australia depends on Earth observation data. In, in an independent government study in 2014, we found that there were about 140 government programs that were dependent on Earth observation data. A 2019 um, national workshop run by the Earth Observation for Government Network found that Earth observation data was um, essential um, and being um, utilised and depended on on nine thin areas. Um, these uh, include land cover, land use, vegetation, biomass, water, topography, fire, soils, biosecurity and coastal and oceanic. Australia has no earth observation satellites and relies on international supply. We've been doing that since about 1979 with the USGS or NASA at the time, followed by JAXA, the, which is the Japanese Space Agency, Canada and now the European Commission or Union. Australia is a big user of EI data. Mentioned earlier, Landsat, we've got over 35 years of that data over our country. But in, two, in, 20, sorry, in 2008, the data became free and open. This was um, a, a big shift in the way that Earth observation data was going to be exploited. The European Commission then decided that it will also release the Copernicus program data under a similar policy. So in two, 20, 2014, it promised to release its data from the Sentinel missions free and open to the world. And this was going to be providing a supplementary, if not superior, data source to what we've been exposed to prior to in terms of the spectral, spatial, temporal and reliability on the basis that this was going to be a 20 plus year program. So the challenge was, okay, so this data was coming, it was going to be offering a deluge of free and open data. And uh, how are we going to bring it here? How are we going to access it? So we negotiated an agreement with the European Commission to get permission to get access to it, followed by technical arrangements with the European Space Agency and UMEDSAT. And in close parallel, together we established a consortium of government partners who wanted to get access to this data. New South Wales Government, Queensland, Western Australia, CSIRO and GA came together and they investigated how they will implement or implement a solution to get this data into our hemisphere, into our region in a time, timely and cost effective manner. To give you some uh, context of what we're actually thinking at the moment, on a daily basis we think about four terabytes of data a day. So my computer is about four terabytes in size at home. So that's bringing a computer home every day. That's 28 terabytes per week, 120 terabytes per month, which equates to about 3.5 petabytes to date. And then it's gonna keep growing at a petabyte per year. So based on our investigation, um, the decision was to, to use, uh, in order to bring the data into our region was to use existing government research infrastructure. And, um, and that was um, relying on the GIANT, the GIANT and the RNETs and the NCI. And so basically, based on leveraging of this infrastructure, this has allowed us to make savings in the data transfer costs. We've done some data modelling and costing recently. And if we were to pull, if people were to pull about 10 petabytes of data from the hub, this would probably equate to about a million dollars in transfer costs, egress costs, just for that amount. So by coming together, it was the beginning and keeping together has been the progress, but working together has been our biggest success. Bringing that data into a central location such as Australia, putting it on disk for ready for analytics for those who need to use it to be able to curate, curate and manage it effectively has been um, proven to be our great success. So what does the hub enable us and what does it deliver? Well, it delivers Sentinel products by and for other government agencies served directly and indirectly by the partners and industry users. It provides Sentinel products by and for the benefit of other countries in our region. And this is something that the European Commission um, aim was for us to broaden the user base 
Down Under. And it also provides a range of remote sensing products that are actively used in strategic and tactical public and private organisation decision making. And also used to run programs such as Digital Earth Australia, the state government land and cover monitoring programs, which I'll provide some more information about in subsequent slides. And it also provides um, data for research and development projects in areas of emergency response. We're seeing that in the fire and the floods, compliance work, climate change monitoring, resource management and subsidence monitoring, as just to name a few. So when we asked our partners what the hub provided them, this is what they said, but this is what it actually means. Um, the hub provides us a, a means to get Copernicus data in a managed, efficient way. It is based on relationship and strong partnership, monitoring and able to use that data for various programs and applications and trust. Having trust that that information and it, um, data will be coming through, but also trusting the partnership to be able to achieve the challenges with, which um, which I'll share with you further in this presentation. So to recap, Australia is dependent on EI data for government research programs programs, and it has always been a big user. Australia's also been pretty good at applying it, uh, despite not having its own satellites. With the free and open Earth observation data policies, this in, initially in uh, 2008, followed by 2014, this created opportunities which uh, we basically grabbed, Australia grabbed and ran with, ran with. If it wasn't for these changes in policy, the data cube concept wouldn't have occurred because it would have been just um, inconceivable in terms of the paying for the data itself. Um, the Open Data Cube Consortium wouldn't have existed and the Digital Earth Australia and Africa as we see today as a result of, of that policy change but also the, the innovation that has come as a result of having that access to that data. So Eurovision, coming back to Eurovision. So the Eurovision and Copernicus, Europe's Eye on Earth, both initiatives come from Europe both have let Australia in as a, as a contestant or a partner. Both use satellites as part of their uh, technology repertoire, but now also using internet and uh, to broaden their exposure and influence, appeal and uptake. The importance of both focus on working together, promoting cooperation and making things free and open. So what are we good at? Applying the data, as I mentioned earlier, I'll give you some examples of how the data has been used by our partners. Um, we're pretty good at managing the data, but I think we need to get um, better at it, given the, the amount of data that's going to be coming at us in the next five years. In 2027, we'll be we will be managing 10 petabytes of data and sharing our expertise and tools at Plus Stories. Okay, in this slide, what, it, what you're saying is this is an application um, of Sentinel-1 data. This is an INSAR application showing a time series analysis of surface deformation. The shapes in the left image are sections of an underground mine. In both views, we are seeing the deformation on the surface above the mine over a three year period. This is an, an application um, um, courtesy of um, Matt Garthway and Thomas Furman, who are, are working in um, developing analysis ready Sentinel-1 uh, Sentinel data. And the following slide, which if I can get to, shows the same information. This graph plots the same mine site as measured by geodetic grade GPS receivers, as well as measured by the NSAR. You can see that the INSAR results are as good as the GPS. And in addition, when the GPS had a power outage, as seen in the gap in the graph on the right, the INSAR was able to fill the gaps. So it's these lighter blue 
plots and the lighter orange that filled in the gaps and that came from the ENSA instrument on Sentinel-1. Here's another example of using uh, Sentinel-1 data for deformation mapping. This one is in relation to earthquakes. As we know, Geoscience Australia monitors and analyzes and reports on the occurrence of significant earthquakes in Australia using size, uh, seismometers, uh, which provide rapid information on the magnitude and location of the earthquake. The uncertainties on the location are large to 10 kilometers. And this is due to the sparsity of, sparsity of the seismic uh, monitoring network. INSA fills this gap by mapping spatial patterns of ground surface movement that have occurred at the time between two acquisitions of synthetic aperture radar images and allow teams to target their efforts. So on the 16th of September 2018, there was a 5.7 magnitude earthquake occurred in Lake Muir in Western Australia. GA, GA used Sentinel-1 data to produce this inter, interfer, interferogram where the epicenter is the star. The dotted black line is the five kilometre fault and there is a 28 centimetre displacement on the east and then a further six, six centimetre displacement on the west. The statewide uh, monitoring programs, this is an example from Queensland. Queensland have, has been monitoring their land, landscape for the last 25 years and they've been using various remote sensing data to do that. Their objective was to actually increase the frequency and the resolution of the data. Sentinel data, Sentinel-2 data, provided that opportunity to them. So the Sentinel-2 data that acquired from the hub have provided an additional source of data to complement the existing data sets. Copernicus provides cost-effective and advanced earth observation technology with a long-term mission and plan and open strategies. This provides them with a high resolution ability to map the, um, the, um, um, the state of, their, of, of, their, of, of the whole of the state rather. And on the left here, there's a seasonal fractional ground cover product, which they produce on a seasonal basis. As you can see in this triangle, the green represents green vegetation, which is photosynthetically active. And you've got the bare soil in the red and the non-green vegetation, which is probably um, either um, non-active or it's, 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 it's brown. So the impact of implementing or using Sentinel data has enabled them to increase the frequency and the high resolution visibility of what's happening right across Queensland. And this has been used to inform NRM policy and reporting, managing the Great Barrier Reef and providing input to their state reporting requirements and other regulatory and um, compliance frameworks. Industry hasn't missed out either. Sentinel data has been used by a number of industry parties. CBO Labs is um, an analytics um, company which has worked closely with Digital Earth Australia and they are utilising um, Sentinel data similarly to produce a fractional cover product which is then converted to what they call a total standing dry matter product, which is overlaid with paddock boundaries, which identifies which boundary or which paddock should be stocked with a number of beef and cattle. So it helps with the stocking numbers in, for the beef industry. Another example here is the development of an early detection system for land clearing. New Queensland has developed or has tested a system where they're able to automate the development of um, changes on the ground on a, week, on a fortnightly basis. And this is used as a, an early alert system to engage with the land the landowners rather than produced a product on an annual basis and using as a punitive measure. Sentinel data has also been used in developing um, fire extent severity mapping. So the New South Wales Rural Fire Service, as you know, is responsible for protecting 95% of the land area in New South Wales. So developing a consistent approach to mapping fire extent and, and severity across New South Wales has been explored. 
As a result, a, ma a machine learning algorithm has been developed to undertake supervised classification, get, um, um, feeding an input from a various number of spatial information, including uh, sentinel data. This creates a phi extent severity map, as you can see here in the, in the graph. And uh, what this is being used for is to help facilitate rapid post fire response and post fire field assessments. Um, the Great Barrier Reef, here's an example of Sentinel-2 again, utilising the data before and after shots of the bleaching effects that it can be um, visually picked up in these images. So the Sentinel image here on the top um, quadrant uh, on the left was taken at uh, tw uh, 8th of June 2016 and a follow-up image a few eight months or so later on the 23rd of February 2017. And if you look at the zoomed up images under those, you can actually visually see that those pixel, pixels have actually lightened up. And um, that's showing the crest slope of the actual reef of um, Adelaide Reef and the Great Barrier Reef. So managing the data from the Copernicus Data Hub. So we've been in, um, we've We've been around for about three and a half to four years now, and part of our role is to manage that data effectively. As a result of doing that, we've developed some platforms uh, for reporting and monitoring, but also managing the risks when managing such a huge amount of data. Based on the uh, reporting requirements and communicating with our partners, we developed a reporting tool uh, specific for Copernicus. This was a pilot um, platform which um, is going to be released publicly at the moment. It's um, it's in a, it's in its final stages of being um, deployed beyond our um, DMZ. But the Copernicus program has also uh, provided um, a case for other reporting tools that Nemo will also look at developing, exploring for the DEA. Um, program as well as the marine program within Nemo. We also um, built specific portals for um, the Sentinel uh, Australasia Regional Access Portal and this technology is also being currently looked at um, for, the, uh, for the DEA Access Platform which um, is under development as well. The CMI platform is um, a platform that was developed within operations within Nemo. I'm looking at um, leveraging off this particular platform to help us um, document and report the life life cycle plans of our products within the the, the uh, regional data hub. This is going to be important for us because as we move forward, as we're going to be managing, managing larger amounts of uh, data, we need to have a track and a trace of how we plan to do that based on user uh, patterns, but also priority requirements of our partners. The BI, BI, BI tool on the bottom here, sorry, um, is another tool that we're currently using to actually drill into what products, uh, how much of those products are currently in existence and require storage at the NCI. These tools have all sort of evolved in the last 18 to 12 months, and we're looking at leveraging of other tools that uh, uh, are developed within the, the operations area of, of NEMO. So we do a lot of cross fertilization in terms of leveraging of existing um, tools in order to, to better manage uh, projects and programs. Here is a, um, a couple of slides from the reporting tool itself. Um, as you can see in the top graph, this is actually uh, representing the growth of our hub. On a monthly basis, you can see the amount of terabytes um, that, are, that are accumulating. The gap here, uh, the dip down has been a result of a steering committee decision to purge data outside our region of interest. When we initiated the hub, we we decided to sync all the data from Europe. For Sentinel-3, we felt we could sync the whole global data set. And about three years into the project, we realised we can't continue paying for that storage. So we decided to clip the Sentinel-3 coverage down to our region of interest. And as a result, this was a saving of about $150,000 to the project, where we purged 142. Uh, petabytes. So at the moment, um, I would like to see this tool evolve, um, that it has 
live data at the moment. It's a static one month reporting. Um, but in the future, I'd like to be able to use that as a decision tool to actually move forward and make decisions of which products that we keep or purge or put on cold storage, which I'll talk a bit more about in my next few slides. The slide below is exactly the same information, but it's actually showing the different mission data. As I said, we, we use um, these tools to report to our partners on our performance. Um, directly, we um, report on key performance indicators on a monthly basis. So the top graph actually is showing you the product latency. So it shows you how long it takes for the product to be um, acquired from the satellite and land in the European hubs. And then the following uh, graph below, it actually maps and returns the results of when the data actually leaves the, the European hubs and lands in our regional hub here in Australasia or Australia. The two lines above you see is the blue line is our target. So that's our key performance indicator of trying to get this data within um, 12 hours of hitting the European hubs. And the green line is what we're performing at. So we're <clears throat> above and beyond the 90% mark. The graph below is just a bit more detail. We can actually um, zoom into the tool and identify on a per, per product basis. And this is important for us because Sentinel-3 has time critical products, near real time products and so forth. So they come in within 3, 12, 36 and so forth hours and we can monitor that. This is the BI tool that has been uh, built recently. And this is another tool that we're going to be using as part of our decision <clears throat> making and what data we need to leave um, on disk, potentially what we put on tape if, if we move into that direction. As I previously mentioned, all the data currently sitting on disk, but this is creating a problem for us in terms of costing and keeping that available on disk <clears throat> moving into the future. The challenge we have is the data storage cost at NCI. Although it's still the most cost effective option uh, than any public commercial cloud, for us to store three petabytes um, and then an annual growth of um, one petabyte uh, a year is actually exceeding the current partner's ability to contribute towards the hub um, for next financial, financial year and beyond. So what we've done to um, address this is um, we brought in a consultant to look at uh, sustainability pathway options and part of those options is to look at a mixed storage environment and um, other hubs around the world are doing that already um, and that's looking at multi-tier storage whether it's a slow disk fast disk or tape which we call cold storage but for us to move into this environment we have to invest um, and basically that requires um, a, a fair bit of um, investment and um, reshaping the way that we work. As part of that, we need to also introduce a management governance framework, which allows us to be able to be more stringent in the way that we manage at a product level rather than a mission level. And we also <clears throat> need to explore um, other funding sources uh, to bring in either new partners or opportunities to ensure the longevity of this asset as it grows. So by doing all of that, we still are focused on continuing to support the discoverability and the distribution of the data through that old hub and via Sarah, which requires upgrading, but also um, our aim is to continue broadening our user base beyond the current partners to include industry research, nonprofit organisations. And that's one of the, ob another obligation we have with the European Commission as part of this arrangement. So we're challenged at the moment where we're going to need to upgrade our existing infrastructure, but we also have to move into a mixed environment and also manage the data at a product level. So we've done some costings initially and we understand that we need to pivot into an environment where it's going to give us more flexibility. So that conversation has begun with our partners and we're at this point in time in making those decisions as we grow and mature. The governance framework that has been pr proposed to us is um, looks something like this. Um, we've got the first tier and second tier and third tier in place, but we have to elaborate more on 
developing a feed information from our user base. So creating focus groups around mission and mission experts is something we've just started to do, but we need to tap into that knowledge base as we move forward as to which data we keep on disk, what we move on to tape or put on slow disk, but maintain our operations in, in having accessibility to the data on, on a needs basis. We've done the costings in terms of what this actually means in money terms, and this is important to that partnership because they're all contributing. And we've invested about $3.4 million into the hub um, since its inception. But as it grows, as I mentioned earlier, by 2027, we're going to have 10 petabytes of data to manage. And that is going to cost us on an annual basis. It's cumulatively going to cost us an additional $6 million. So how do we do that in the most cost effective and agile way is something that we need to look at closely. So these, these numbers are based on some modelling that we've done. And as you can see, the pie at the moment, we've only got six shares. So we need to either grow the number of partners or we go to reduce the amount of data we're sinking, or we're going to have to start moving on to cold storage, or we're going to purge it. So they're the, 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 the challenges that we face today. The challenges have also brought us some opportunities. So one of the opportunities was looking at broadening our partnerships um, and bringing in other partners. Um, the Australian Research Data Commons recently uh, had a call out for, uh, for Australian data partnership programs. We've just submitted the proposal, I think it was last week, and it aligns very nicely to the uh, challenges and, and the opportunities that we want to pursue as part of the hub. And that's to improve our asset for support of leading edge research. So ensuring research is being done beyond our partners. So there are five outputs that we um, identified as aligning with partnering with the AIDC and that's improving our discoverability of the data and that's basically upgrading the CERA portal if we, as we wanted to do anyway and complying with the FAIR principles. At the moment our data doesn't do that. Looking at enhancing our policy and, and governance arrangements and that's all about bringing um, the feeder information from our user base but also broadening and depositing our capture workflows to aid sustainability. So looking possibly at the mixed storage environment, maybe even a distributed model approach where we partner also with Pawsey. Because Pawsey at the moment um, hub is about 1.8 of the hub's um, uh, data and that's due to Langate being a partner of ours. We're also looking at broadening uh, and the environment for creation of uh, applications. At the moment, the NCI is primarily used by its partners, NCI, GA and um, CSIRO. But what we'd like to see is other researchers, uh, academia, possibly industry coming in and tapping into that data source as well with some compute. Broadening the awareness, we've developed some training material which needs further refinement if we want to spread the word about our existence um, and that's also an opportunity through this ARDC partnership. So to recap, um, based on having EO data available and being great appliers, Australia is really good at building state international programs using EO data. We've developed platforms and reporting tools to help us monitor and manage risks that we are being confronted with. And this has helped increase our transparency and building trust. We also um, are learning how to use cross um, sharing tools and development resources across NEMA, which has also been a very positive experience. And not to mention, um, with the closer examination of our challenges, it's actually creating opportunities. Um, and we've already started to act on those, but we have lots more to do. So I, by finishing with that spiel about Copernicus, I'm going to come back to Eurovision and leave you with some visual sensory of, from Eurovision and Copernicus. On the left here, you see Lordi. This is a, a band from uh, Finland who performed the song rock Hallelu uh, Hard Rock Hallelujah. This was um, one of, at the tw uh, 2006 Eurovision um, contest. And on the right hand side here, you have an image from the Copernicus program, which is a beautiful image of Europe, which was a mosaic 
uh, developed over a five month period showing um, what amazing pictures that the Copernicus program can bring us. So in a sense, what you're seeing here is beauty and the beast. With the audio sensory, if I could only play you this song, which I can't because it doesn't come across very well on this platform, the winner of the 2006 contest was the German artist Lena, who sang a song called Satellite. So like um, with um, the connections, I guess, in terms of Eurovision and the Copernicus program, the similarities in terms of the principles and values of sharing, being open and utilising satellite images. It's interesting that if you read the lyrics of the song here on your right, the chorus, like satellite, I'm in orbit all the way around you and I would fall out into the night. Can't go a minute without your love. Strangely enough, it brings us back to love. And as we began this presentation of what love got to do with it uh, it ends with exactly well love has everything to do with it and um, Copernicus and Eurovision thank you thank you Ala I think that was just a fantastic presentation um, I particularly enjoyed the link between Eurovision and our Copernicus Australasia uh, regional data hub I think um, I could sense a lot of love in terms of the science that you were presenting today. Um, and I just want to note that if you have any questions for Ella, please pop them in the chat window. Um, I just wanted to draw out a couple of things that I heard during the presentation that really stood out for me. And first of all is really around the strength of that partnership and just the size of the partnerships in terms of our partnership with Europe and of course, partnership here in Australia in terms of high impact use and application of the Sentinel data. And there were some really great examples there uh, that INSA particularly stood out for me. And I also really enjoyed that we're thinking about, okay, what's the best management options in terms of such a big data store that we have in our Sentinel data sets? And obviously we've got 5P now as well. And what does that look like when you're actually consuming as much as the petabyte of data um, per annum? So a really great presentation, um, Ella, um, really enjoyed it. Um, again, if you have any questions, please do post them in the chat window. I know Steve was inter interested if you could sing that song, but I think we've got the YouTube video there so um, people can... Uh, people can jump online. But I do have one question that comes to mind and maybe it's just a little bit topical given the current situation that we're in um, with the COVID pandemic and of course all of, all of the travel restrictions that come with that. And just noting the importance of that partnership and the success of working together. Um, so what, what has um, been pivotal to continue the successful partnership in the current environment that we're in? Um, I think the most important thing for us is um, the trust. Um, we've developed that trust over the three and a half years and uh, we, we know that regardless of the obstacles that have been placed in front of us, being able to overcome each challenge has built that partnership stronger. So the COVID environment um, hasn't really changed the business for us because we always would have uh, virtual meetings on a monthly basis where it has slightly changed our uh, approach is not being able to meet face to face every six months. Um, but uh, I think trust is the real key here um, and I'm proud to say that uh, having the state government trust us, a federal agency, to work together um, in this technical field um, for me is quite rewarding because they have got so much expertise um, uh, and, 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 and we do too. So by sharing um, and working together is really ensuring that Australia is getting the best out of this, out of this information or out of this data. Yeah, that's right. It's all built on trust and a strengthened partnership. So that's great, Ella. I do have one question that's just come in um, asking, are we looking at international partners such as Indonesia government bodies? 
Definitely. Part of part of sort of uh, our evolution, one of the things I didn't mention in the presentation is to bring in a business development resource as part of um, partnering with ARDC was one example. We recognise that a lot of people still don't know we exist um, and we do know other countries in our region are taking um, advantage of what we do here and if I know the European Commission have struck their own arrangements with Asia we we have an opportunity maybe here through the DFAT arrangements that we've got um, that maybe we can um, work uh, with the international group within NEMO for instance and, and pursue some of those partnerships through those channels definitely. That's a great synopsis. So I can't see any further questions uh, coming through on our chat line. Um, Ella, I just want to thank you for joining us today. It really was um, an engaging, uh, you know, insightful presentation. Um, no doubt all of us enjoyed the link between Eurovision and the Copernicus Regional Data Hub. Um, just fantastic. Um, Ella, on behalf of GA and our virtual audience today, thank you. And we have a small token of appreciation to pass to you. Oh, thank you. So, <laughs> much for your presentation today, um, very insightful. Um, for our attendees, our virtual audience, please join us again next week um, when Hadi Gassini, uh, Phil Cummins and Mark Edwards will be presenting on the new seismic hazard map of Papua New Guinea, seismotectonics, probabilistic ground motions and the building code. Um, Papua New Guinea likes in a belt of intense tecton tectonic activity that experiences really high levels of seismicity, although this seismicity um, actually poses quite significant risk to society. The building codes within PNG and its underpinning seismic loading requirements haven't actually been re revised until 1982. So we'll be presenting on the study that actually aims to address um, this gap uh, by updating the seismic zoning map on which the earthquake loading component of the building code is based. So we look forward to you joining us uh, next week at our DGAL. And thank you again, Allah, and have a great day, everyone. Thank, thank you, Alison. You.